Today, we're going to talk about mostly the Battle of Kipps Bay, which occurred September 15th, 1776, and is the next battle in my series about the Battle for New York. Check out those other videos so that you can catch up the Battle of New York as it's proceeding in the summer and fall of 1776. I have a whole series of those battles which cover everything that's going on from July of 1776 up until now, the end of September. I'm Mrs. Q, thank you for joining me. Now when I was trying to figure out talking about the Battle of Kipps Bay and how to make it interesting to you because I know a lot of people don't think military history is that interesting. I started thinking that I might ask you a question to ask yourself as we're talking about these events. And that question is, if you were alive in 1776 and you witnessed all of the events through what I'm going to talk about in this video, would you still be a rebel? Would you still stand against England? Do you think you have what it takes to do that? Today, you know, in media, we're hearing all about who is a patriot, who's not a patriot, what does it mean to be a patriot? Well, let's talk about what it meant to be a rebel or a patriot in 1776. And let's see if you think you could have stuck it out. So up until now, the Battle for New York has been raging since August 22nd, a little bit more than a month. And as you know from watching my other videos, if you saw them, this is a big strategic battle for both sides. Britain wants to take Manhattan Island in order to use it as a forward operating base and it's strategic because of all the waterways, right? We have the Atlantic Ocean right there, making it easily accessible for the Royal Navy. The Royal Navy, of course, is key in the Revolutionary War because England has a massive supply line, goes all the way back to London. So how are they going to get everything over here? Their Navy. How are they going to move their troops around? Their Navy. So accessibility to the Navy is key. So right from the Atlantic Ocean, you can get right to Manhattan Island. New York Harbor protects Manhattan Island, right? If you put guns on either side of the entrance to the harbor, you're protecting entry from the Atlantic Ocean. And once you're in New York Harbor, you can head up the Hudson River on the west side, right, to the interior of the Northeast. And you can head up the East River on the east side out to the Long Island Sound, the North Shore of Long Island and New England. Key for England. General Washington's goal that summer, keep it from happening. Keep the British from taking Manhattan Island. And as you know, from watching the videos up until this point, there hasn't been very much success for Washington's army. And although they have lost every encounter with the English, they have not surrendered and they've not given up. So now the next battle to come will be September 15th, 1776, the Battle of Kipps Bay. This is the only time in American history that Manhattan Island has been invaded and occupied by a foreign army. But before we get to Kipps Bay, we're gonna take a little detour. Kipps Bay, by the way, is around 26 to 34th Street on the east side. Sorry, I took for granted. I always think I'm talking to New Yorkers. Kipps Bay is on the east side of the island, from about 26 to 34th Street, as you can see from the map here. But before we talk about that, we're going to head back down to Lower Manhattan to Wall Street and Water Street. Now, if you've been in that intersection or you've been on my tour, my Revolutionary War tour, this is what it looks like today. And if you've been on my Revolutionary War tour, you've also seen this picture of what it looked like in 1776, or this picture is actually 1774, but that's close enough, right? Didn't change much in two years. And the wharf you're looking out on, so this is looking out from the bottom of Wall Street, out into the East River. And what you're seeing here is something called Murray's Wharf, one of the most important docks in colonial New York City. Now, who are the Murrays? Well, the Murrays are a Quaker family who um, owns a shipping company. Right? This is their commercial wharf. And as Quakers, of course, they're going to at least declare that they're neutral during the Revolutionary War. So the Murrays live, or go back uptown, or at least to Midtown, right near Kipps Bay, and an area some of you might know today, if we look on a map, is called Murray Hill. Same family. Murray Hill is named for the Murrays, but it wasn't called Murray Hill then. It was called Eichlenburg. And Eichlenburg was their home, their country estate where they lived. Now, the key Murray family member in our story today is going to be Mrs. Murray, Mary Murray. 
husband is Robert Murray. He owns the shipping company. Mary Murray is one of the wealthiest and most respected ladies in New York City. She has a private carriage. She has a wonderful home, a lovely wine cellar filled with the finest Spanish Madeira wine. The Madeira wine was the sign of your wealth and sophistication at that time. So we'll just for the moment leave the Murrays there at their home at Eichlenburg and return to the Battle of Kipps Bay. So you might know now there's been no military activity since August 29th when General Washington and his army crossed the East River from Brooklyn to Manhattan under cover of darkness. The British have not yet attacked Washington's position on the island. And you might have also known, I did a little video in between here about a secret peace conference that was going on in Staten Island at that time. Well, Washington can't figure out why Howe hasn't just come straight across the East River and attacked him at Manhattan, especially now when he's weak, discombobulated, his troops are all over the place. Why doesn't Howe just cross the East River and attack him then? Washington comes to believe that it's taking Howe so long to do that, maybe he's not coming that way. Maybe instead, Howe is going to do what Washington originally expected him to do, either attack from the south, attack right on with the Navy from New York Harbor, and attack the town at the bottom of the island, then the whole of New York City, or come down the Hudson River and attack along the Hudson and East River on the northern part of the island. Because Washington is expecting this, he is going to spread out his troops that way. So he's going to have a huge bunch of troops on lower Manhattan, about 3,000, under command of General Israel Putnam. And he's going to be at the northern end of the island with General Nathaniel Green and the rest of the army. Guarding the East River side of the island, just in case the British decide to come that way, is a line of militia soldiers. And one of those soldiers, Joseph Plum Martin, says they're barely armed, that many of them only have sharpened sticks with which to fight. Now, if you still happen to be a civilian on Manhattan Island, and there weren't many left by now, Washington had issued a general order for everyone to get off the island who could, but if you were still there, you would have awakened that morning, September 15th, it was a Sunday morning, probably planning to go to church, but before you could go to church, you would have noticed there were warships on both sides of the island. Four of them in the Hudson River and five of them in the East River. And those East River ships would have included three major naval warships or men of war, if they would call them. The Phoenix and the Roebuck, 44 guns each, and the Rose, 32 guns and two smaller ships accompanying them. So now the bottom part of the island from about 42nd Street down on both sides of the water is filled with warships. And coming across the East River from the Brooklyn Queen side out of the Newtown Creek begins hundreds of flatboats. A huge invasion is coming from the Brooklyn Queen's side. And to cover that invasion, is a near three hour cannonade of artillery fire coming from these ships. So what would it be like for you to be there? Well, let's take a look at some firsthand accounts of people who witnessed this event. So here's the account of a soldier. His name was Joseph Plum Martin. Martin enlisted in 1775. He was 15 years old at the time. And although he went home a couple of times during the war, he stayed in for most of the war and he wrote a memoir about his experiences. Some of you might have read it. So Martin was at Kipps Bay. So what did he have to say about it? As soon as it was fairly light, we saw their boats coming out of a creek or cove on the Long Island side of the water filled with British soldiers. When they came to the edge of the tide, they formed their boats in line. They continued to augment their forces from the island until they appeared like a large clover field in full bloom and now was coming on the famous Kipps Bay Affair, which has been criticized so much by the historians of the revolution. I was there and will give a true statement of all that I saw during that day. He then goes on to say that he and some fellow soldiers were in someone's barn when the whole thing started, looking through some papers. He says, when all of a sudden there came such a peal of thunder from the British shipping that I thought my head would go with the sound. I made a frog's leap for the ditch and lay as still as I possibly could and began to consider 
which part of my carcass was to go first. Next, the Reverend Schaukirk of the Moravian Church talks also about the sound of the cannon fire. He says that everything on the island shook. All of the houses, he says your body shook, the inside shook. He said some of the balls blasted through people's homes and miraculously no one was killed. And he did say that as savage as it was, he decided to still hold services that afternoon and was the only church in the town that did so. Next is Lieutenant Colonel Archibald Robinson, who was aboard the warship, the man of war Rose. And he says, then the signal was made to advance toward the shore in their proper divisions, upon which all the ships began to fire and kept up an incessant roar and their guns well directed our boats were quite covered with smoke. The scene altogether was grand and noble. Robertson then talks about landing on Manhattan Island. And he says, the horror and fright of the few inhabitants in the first house we came to was shocking. Well, the militiamen guarding the East River know that there is no way that they can fight what's coming toward them. And of course, their ranks are going to all break up and they all turn and they run. But by that time, General Washington and the men at the northern part of the island realized what was happening and started riding down toward Kipps Bay. And this is where the firsthand accounts are really interesting. They talk about how General Washington is riding toward the East River and his militia is running away right past him. We have a number of accounts that say that Washington got so angry, he got off of his horse, threw his hat on the ground and exclaimed, are these the men with which I have to defend America? The British now are going to come ashore unopposed at Kipps Bay. And we find out that one of the first things they do is head toward the home of Robert Murray. And this is where our story gets really kind of interesting. So it's gonna take time, right, for the English to land all of those boats on Manhattan Island. Well, all they have to do once they land is march their forces straight across the island from east to west, say around where 42nd Street is. If you've been on 42nd Street, you can kind of picture them walking from the east side to the west side, maybe through Times Square as it is today, um, to block off the bottom half of the island where General Israel Putnam's men are. So this is what they're planning to do. So in the meantime, they come to the Murray house and who is there but Mary Murray. And the story tells us that Mary Murray then invited the officers to afternoon tea, where they enjoyed her fine Spanish Madeira. They had tea and pastries, fun and civil conversation, and even the royal governor Tryon attended this affair and began to tease Mary Murray about her rebel friends, as it was well known that Mary Murray had a close relationship with the New York Sons of Liberty. Now, what they don't know is that while they're delaying at Eichlenburg, and waiting for the rest of the troops to land, the Israel Putnam's men are heading up the island to join the rest of Washington's army at Harlem Heights. And they are being led by a young captain named Aaron Burr. The great New York City historian, Martha J. Lamb, who wrote a wonderful two volume set about the Revolutionary War in New York, tells us about the heroism of young Captain Burr who led a column, 3,600 people, two miles long on this winding path, evading the British all the way up to the northern end of the island. And at one point, they were within one half mile of each other. Incredible story, isn't it? And eventually the British made their cutoff, right? They made it across the island, but by then, Israel Putnam's men were all the way up at the northern end of the island. Now, over the years, I have had plenty of people email me, tell me on my tours, get in touch with me and say, oh, Karen, you know that didn't really happen, that that's just an old story about Mary Murray. Really? It didn't happen? Well, let's look at the diary of Mr. James Thatcher, M.D., a doctor who was also an officer in Washington's army. And let's see what Dr. Thatcher had to say. Most fortunately, the British generals, seeing no prospect of engaging our troops, halted their own and repaired to the house of a Mr. Robert Murray, a Quaker and friend of our cause. 
Mrs. Murray treated them with cake and wine and they were induced to tarry two hours or more, Governor Tryon frequently joking her about her American friends. By this happy incident, General Putnam, by continuing his march, escaped an encounter with a greatly superior force. It has since become almost a common saying among our officers that Mrs. Murray saved this part of the American army. And there are other accounts on the part of Washington soldiers that this really did happen. So tell me again that it's all an old wives tale and never happened. Now, there might be some discrepancy over why and how it happened as some stories say Mary Murray went out and purposely delayed them to enable the Americans to escape. And then there are other stories that say that while they were there, since they were there, she offered them afternoon tea. Either way, Mary Murray has done a great patriotic thing for the Americans. So she's delayed them just long enough so the army can rejoin the other part and the northern part of the island. So yay to Mary Murray. The next day, September 16th, the British make an attempt on Washington's position in Harlem Heights at the northern end of the island. And the Americans are able to deter that attack. So although they have been losing all the way up until this point, they have a bit of a victory here at Harlem Heights and it buoys their spirits and makes things look a little bit better. But were they really better? Because right about then, while they're defending Harlem Heights, the British are taking control of Lower Manhattan from about 42nd Street down to the tip of the island. So they now have all of that real estate themselves to occupy. So that maybe isn't so great, is it? So now if you're in New York, you're watching this and you might be happy to hear that Washington's forces were successful at Harlem Heights, but wow, they've been pushed now all the way up to the northern part of the island. And the British are now taking possession, physical possession of the island. What does that mean for you? What does that mean for your property? If you have a business, what does it mean for your business? If you're a rebel, are you gonna stay a rebel? That means you're going to have to leave the island. You don't know when you're going to come back. You don't know if you'll come back. You don't know what will happen to what you leave behind. Say you leave property behind, a house. Well, British soldiers are gonna live in your house now, right? You have maybe a business, maybe they're gonna use it as a stable or a hospital or something, or for officers' quarters or for even regulars' quarters. You don't know what's going to happen to your property if you leave. So if you were a rebel at this point in 1776, would you still be a rebel? Or would you accept General Howe's offer of clemency? You know, um, swear off everything you've done up until this point, take an oath of loyalty to the king, stay here with us in New York, we'll protect you and everything will be forgiven. Maybe you'd do that. Maybe you wouldn't wanna run. Maybe it would be you know, too much for you. Maybe seeing the performance of Washington's army and how bad it's been up until this point, you might think, hey, there's no way we can fight the British. I'm gonna take the offer now while things are good before there's going to be retribution against us. So think about that a little bit. Where would you be, say, September 16th, 1776, right after you get news that the Americans have successfully defended Harlem Heights, but they have lost everything else. So now you might be waiting around to see what will happen next. And on September 21st, New York City will burn. It is the Great Fire of 1776. It starts the southern tip of the island near Francis Tavern, and it will burn one mile north up to St. Paul's Chapel. On the way, it destroys Trinity Church, the Church of England, a number of other churches, and 400 to 500 dwellings. Gone. The fire is so huge that ships in the Hudson River north of Manhattan Island can see it and ships in the Hell's Gate. That's the area that connects the East River with the Long Island Sound. And those British ships begin making their way down toward the town to see if they can assist in putting out the fire. But mostly attempts to stop the fire are useless. Now the New York City Fire Department, which did exist at that time, and was full of lots of loyalists, so they were still in New York City, managed to stop the fire near St. Paul's Chapel and save St. Paul's. They began a bucket brigade up from the Hudson River and then raised the buckets up to the roof of St. Paul's Chapel where they doused the roof with water to keep embers from setting fire to the roof. 
They also wet the fields around St. Paul's Chapel, again, so embers would not set any of the graveyard on fire. And the fire stopped a short distance um, around St. Paul's Chapel. So the St. Paul's Chapel that you see today, if you visit New York City, is the same chapel that survived the fire of 1776. And at that time, it was 10 years old. It was built in 1766. So it was a horrific night for the residents of New York City. September 21st, 1776. So I ask you, if you saw that fire, would you still be a rebel? Would you still be staying in the city? Or would you get out? Or would you take that offer of clemency? And until this day, it's still debated who started that fire and why. But it seems like the most likely story was that it started in a tavern near Francis Tavern. And so a horrible situation on September 21st. Now, while the fire is burning on September 21st, something else happens. September is quite a month in New York City in 1776. Something else happens. And that is a young man named Nathan Hale is captured and accused of spying. So you remember the Nathan Hale story from school? Now, in the summer of 1776, as this battle for New York is going on, Washington needs intelligence. You know, he is far inferior forces. He needs superior intelligence. So he sends out word to his commanders in the region that he's looking for young officers to spy, to put on civilian clothes, go move among the British, bring back intelligence and share it. Find out what they can about General Howe's plans for the invasion of New York. And Nathan Hale volunteers to do this. Hale's commander tries to dissuade him. He says, oh, you don't want to be a spy. Being a spy is a notorious profession. It's a bad thing to be remembered for. And he tries and tries, but Hale insists he wants to take on this mission. He meets with General Washington. The plan is that a small boat of some kind will come across to Connecticut from Long Island, across the Long Island Sound, pick up Nathan Hale, drop him off Long Island, and Nathan Hale will then make his way into British lines and collect as much information and knowledge as he can. Now, there are numerous stories of when and how Nathan Hale was captured. For many years, the story was that he was captured right on Long Island at Huntington. Other stories say he made it as far as New York and was captured trying to enter the city during the time of the fire. And that's the story I'm going to go with, is there are many eyewitnesses who claim that's what happened. But again, you know, it's really hard to know. So I'm just going to you know, stick with that story because I'm talking about the fire. So let's say Nathan Hale is captured the night of the fire. They ask him what he's doing there. And he says, I'm here to get a job as a teacher. And he shows his Yale diploma, his teaching certificate, references, all of that stuff. It looks good. And um, then they inspect the lining of his jacket and they find his commission papers and the intelligence he's been collecting. And they just call him a spy. Hale was then taken to the headquarters of General William Howe, which was pretty far uptown, 68th Street and about First Avenue today, the old Beekman Mansion. And Howe kind of looks at everything and he says, oh, this kid's a spy, hang him tomorrow. And you know, that's what happened. The next day, September 22nd, 1776, 21-year-old Nathan Hale was hanged as a spy. Whoa, um, four years later, that is going to have major consequences, right? Because some really important guy in the British military is going to get hanged as a spy um, almost a year to the day that Nathan Hale was hanged. And we're going to talk about that in another video. Some of you might know who that was and what that situation was. So Nathan Hale um, is hanged. And the accounts of the British at that time say that they left his body hanging for three days and then in someone's yard, they found a wooden cutout of a soldier. They took it and they wrote George Washington on it and they put it next to him. And they left that all for three days. And then they buried Captain Hale in an unmarked grave. And we have this British account of Nathan Hale's last words. Let me just get it up here so I can read it for you. Just before he expired, he said aloud, I'm so satisfied with the cause in which I have engaged that my only regret is that I have not more lives than one to offer in its service. So here we are, the end of September, 1776. Brooklyn has been lost. The lower part of Manhattan Island has been lost. The city has been burned. 
Nathan Hale, a brave young officer, has been hanged as a spy. Not only that, I didn't do a video about this, but there was also in June an attempt to assassinate General Washington with one of his own bodyguards involved in that. That was the Thomas Hickey plot you might know about. So if you had been seeing all of this throughout 1776, the massive Navy of over 500 warships, 40,000 invading army, Washington's army completely undisciplined, unable to stand and fight, you know, just a few regiments that really know what they're doing now, pretty much running away from the British. Would you still stand and fight? Would you still do it? Or would you take General Howe's offer and say, okay, I'll take the offer. I'm going to be safer this way. It was a very hard decision to make. So if you're thinking, yeah, I'd still be with it, great. Because we're gonna see what you'll be thinking by the end of the year. The people who stuck with this, who stuck with the American Revolution, who did not change their minds and go over to the British side to save themselves, are some of the strongest, bravest men and women of American history. I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, please subscribe to my channel, um, like and share the video, and stay tuned because I still have more about 1776 to share and to challenge you a little bit about how you view yourself and how you view the time period. So thank you again for watching, and I'll see you next time.